So stop me if you've heard this one before. You're a PSVR owner, you know, you love your headsets, you've got this game you're looking forward to, you might even have pre-ordered this because you're looking forward to it so much and you want to play it straight away on midnight. And so the release date finally arrives and you play the game, you boot it up and the game is so fundamentally broken and or crippled with just baffling choices. Maybe it's my imagination, but this seems especially prevalent on PSVR. Now don't get me wrong, I know that there's plenty of flat games out there that launch and they're not in the best states and they need patches and whatever to, to be what they need to be, especially when it comes to online multiplayer titles. But when it comes to PSVR titles these days, I almost feel like maybe I should expect them to not be where they should be at launch. And if I don't get the review code, I'm kind of hanging back. I'm not buying day one anymore. I'm thinking I'll just wait for the patches to come out. Aspire 1 is a really good example of this. This is a game that I was really high hyped over based on the trailers that we had seen. Now of course I knew that Aspire 1 was a multi-platform title, I knew that the trailers we had seen that was all going to be PC viewer footage, so what I wanted to do was I was just going to wait for the PS viewer stuff to be confirmed as functional and then I was going to hop in. Now as a lot of you may know Aspire 1 was originally going to be released in August but it got delayed multiple times. Sometimes it got delayed with like less than 24 hours gnosis which is not great so the developers of aspire one digital load they were saying at the time that the reason for the delay was that they wanted to incorporate the feedback they were getting from playtesters and from people who were playing their game at trade shows and whatnot and fix some of the issues that people were finding so that's fine as far as i'm concerned i mean i'm sure we're all familiar with the quotes that you know a rushed game will forever be bad you know but a, a delayed one will eventually be good so that's fine you know i don't mind that given hardly any gnosis that's a little bit shitty but you know whatever you know eventually it's going to be a good game that's what i thought so when aspire one did eventually launch in this past november you'd be forgiven for not being too happy with what we actually got. Now, first of all, the PS Viewer version of Aspire 1 was outsourced to a different company. I don't think anybody knew that beforehand. This is always something when you hear that a game has been outsourced to a different, like a port has been outsourced to a different company. It's always something that maybe you should be a little bit concerned about just in case it's not as the, it's not up there as the same high quality as what the, the main developers are doing. And that certainly turned out to be the case with the PS Viewer port of Aspire 1. You know, a quick search on Redis will show you that Aspire 1 on PS4 launched with blurred visuals, just terrible AI, any amount of bugs, and to say nothing of the lack of settings that you would just expect to be there in a VR game by now, leaving us with forced blinders and click turning. Now of course that last one isn't really a, a QA issue, it's more of a, a decision made by the developers but that's a whole separate thing i mean it could be its own whole video and i'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this video too but anyway some of the positive impressions i saw from people who were enjoying aspire one were saying things like you know just embrace the bugs you know find find enjoyment in the bugs the bud the bugs add to the game i'm sorry that's i mean that's not really a, a great recommendation and it is a shame because a lot of people do seem to agree that underneath all the crap there is a good game in Aspire 1, it's just been hidden by all these issues. Now since launch, Aspire 1 has gotten some updates, the visuals have been improved and whatnot, but it's still not at that point of what you would have expected from going by the trailers or whatever. So were this not a virtual reality title, I imagine there'd be some media sites kind of all over this, going deep dives, you know, what happened to Aspire 1, why is it in this state, like, you know, the same way maybe aliens colonial marines that want that kind of a that kind of a treatment maybe but because it's a viewer title it kind of gets swept on, under the rug you know nobody's really talking about it but the question i have is where was sony and all of this you know i mean for many years now i've been hearing that sony's qa is one of the most if not the most rigorous out of any of the gaming platforms you know with studios having to like resubmit their builds of the game to Sony over and over again until Sony are finally happy with whatever build they eventually land on. And that's a big reason why the PlayStation Store isn't overrun by crappy mobile looking titles and you know asset flips and stuff like that. It's because Sony has rigorous QA, quality assurance. Whereas on something like Steam, it's not as rigorous so you're gonna come across a lot of trash on Steam. So it makes you wonder, 
are Sony just more relaxed when it comes to QA for PSVR titles, you know, as long as it hits the stable frame rate so that you can avoid that dreaded VR sickness. I mean, if you look at the recent advertisements that Sony has been putting out for the PSVR, they're kind of bragging about the fact that they've got over 500 titles for PSVR. So is it a case of, you know, quantity over quality to make the PS viewers library look more impressive. I mean, I'm not sure. It seems like that approach would be a good way to drive people away from PS viewer, you know? Let's say I buy a PS viewer for Christmas and I want to play Espire 1. I stick on my helmet and all of a sudden, the first thing that happens, I jump and I get stuck in some geometry and I'm like, oh, this is what a PS viewer game is. This is trash. You know, I don't want to play this anymore. This is doing VR as a medium, no favors whatsoever. But besides, the idea of that goes against what we've been hearing from other developers. So, for example, take Contagion VR. Those developers, Monochrome Core, they stated that they had to resubmit their build of the game to Sony over and over again until they got it right. So there are some standards there, at least, but where do Sony draw the line? It's hard to tell. Now, I'm aware I'm picking on Espire 1 a lot here in this video, but there's quite a few games I could put into this category too. So, for example, I recently played Doctor Who The Edge of Time. There was a section near the very end of that game where I was able to consistently hit a bug that would crash the game blue screen like every time, and other people were experiencing the same thing. It wasn't just me, it was something that you could recreate easily enough. That slipped through the cracks. Then there's Warzone, and how that game got on the PSN is just anyone's guess. You know, there's like so many things wrong with that one. Home Sweet Home had a bug at the end, according to Decepticon, where he couldn't complete the game unless he went into the flat mode and then went back into VR mode again. Somehow that was overlooked, and I've experienced as well Sirento VR. I was trying to play with Decepticon, in order to do that I had to change the servers to North America, that's where he is, and the menu just wouldn't respond, it was disabled, you couldn't click on it. It's such a simple thing, just test all the buttons on the UI and that wasn't done. Which is crazy because we have the Sorrento developers just only a few days ago over on Redis saying that the reason that they haven't been updating the PS Viewer with as much content updates as they have the PC and Quest versions is because of Sony's, oh, I'll, I'll just read the quote, is because considerable manpower must be deployed for extensive playtesting to ensure it meets PS viewers' strict experience requirements. Something doesn't add up there at all, you know? And all of this is on top of this other issue we've been seeing when it comes to PS viewer titles. And of course, I am talking about the lack of options in a PS viewer game. Many developers seem to be making these head-scratching decisions when it comes to control schemes and comfort settings. Far too often, I'm seeing click turning only, forced blinders, no smooth locomotion. I mean, all this was okay back in 2016 when VR was still finding its feet, but we're 2020 now practically, in Australia or 2020 right now. Uh, and this is still happening, I mean, Golem is a great example of this. Golem is a great game now. Right now it's a great game. A couple of weeks ago when it launched, it was a frustrating game for me. The absence of options for players to play how they want to play is just baffling. Why wouldn't you just add those options in? And especially the worst part is, the developers, they release these games without the options, they see the feedback uh, that people aren't happy, and it seems to be a simple case of just, you know, a couple of weeks later they've got a patch and they fixed it. And so that implies it doesn't take that much effort if it's only a couple of weeks work, maybe, you know? Uh, so maybe they could have been looking at other games that had these issues and maybe learning from their mistakes so that they couldn't repeat them themselves. And plus, by the time it's fixed, you know, two weeks after launch, it, the damage is done. It's too late, you know? The reviews have been written, the first impressions have been made already. And when it comes to VR, those first impressions are, I think, extra important because a VR game is very likely to fade out of the limelight quicker than like a flat game, you know? Not many games in VR have the stay in power of like something like Destiny, where people are talking about the updates to Destiny all the time or whatever. Maybe Firewall is the only one that you could put into a category like that. So perhaps Sony, if they're monitoring this situation at all, like I hope they are, like I think they should be, maybe they could add these things to their QA checklists. Maybe they could say, hey developers, Look, it's fine to have click turning, it's fine to have teleportation, it's fine to have all that stuff, but you know, just make sure there's an option to turn that stuff off for the people who don't want that. If you have that in as a QA check, then force these developers to do these things. All of a sudden, I don't have to look at reviews, dock and marks from these potentially great games because of these, like, silly, they're stupid issues, they're stupid things that could be avoided in the beginning, and they're just not. 
At least, I can't think of a single reason why you shouldn't have these options for players to disable these things if they don't want them. Anyway, I hope I don't come across as too hard on the PS Viewer. I mean, there's plenty of great PS Viewer titles out there, and they work just as intended. This is just something I wanted to go into a bit deeper because it's something that hasn't really improved since PS Viewer has launched years ago. Uh, it's something that IGN isn't going to talk about, even the likes of Jim Sterling, they're not going to talk about it either because it's VR, you know, it's still not mainstream, it's still not in the public eye, so these kind of things all get swept under the rug and it's up to enthusiasts like us to kind of talk about them, you know? But anyway, be sure to let me know your thoughts on all of this in the comments below, whether you agree, disagree, whatever. And thank you for watching, lads and ladies. Happy New Year to each and every one of you. 2019 was a bit hectic for this channel, thanks to the twins I had, so I wasn't able to put as much time in as I'd like. I'm hoping 2020 I'll be able to turn that around, get some more hours in here, go back to go back to making this channel great again, as Donnie would say. And of course, let me give a special thank you to my Patreon supporters who are on the screen right now. Thanks to the generosity of these people, they're helping this channel grow, and I appreciate it very, very much. And let me give a shout out to the top tier Patreon supporters, Crum, Pete Hawkins, Columbus Thomas III, and Tradition. You gentlemen are beyond moist, you know, you're just absolutely soaking wet, so thank you very much. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter too, then the link will be in the description below. If not, if you'd just like to help out with likes and shares and subscribes and all that usual shite, I'd appreciate that too. And finally, if you've been enjoying the music in these videos, head on over to Spotify or whatever it is you like to listen to and search for Decepticon's new album, Screens and Dreams, it's out now. Check it out. Again, thank you very much for watching and Happy New Year. Bye for now.